there still is this lever for the gas to be turned on and off. And what happened was, as they were having sex on the bed, the bed was moving. Oh, and stop. Mo- yes, this is what happened. The bed was moving. This is in the actual fire investigation report. Gas is going out. The candles are be- are, are in the room. Ah! The moon is set. And boom! All right, everybody, welcome to another great episode of Cases Gone Wild. We have an exciting, crazy, wild, insane show for you today that I'm going to introduce a very special guest who we're honored to have. Remember, Cases Gone Wild is brought to you by Marco Law, where we, where me, John Marco, who's been doing this for almost 20 years, I'm getting a little old, uh, it, long in the tooth on this, bring you the craziest cases that you will not believe. If you like our show, Please remember you can watch us on YouTube or go to my website, MarcoLaw.com and click on the Cases Gone Wild. You can follow us on Audible, all that other good stuff. Share it with loved ones, share it with other people, share it with your neighbors, share it with your dog, share it with whoever, but please get us out there if you like us and leave us a review. Today we have a very special guest, an honored guest, Scott Goodwin. Scott, thank you for coming on the show. Great to be here, John. It's great to have you, man. I've known you for a long time now and I've, I've sat on it. What I really like about you, Scott, is not only are you a great lawyer, not only do you run a great practice and do great work, but you also give back to the community through all kinds of things. You sit, you, I understand you're the former president of the Michigan Association of Justice. You've won all kinds of awards, uh, but you also sit on what's very important. We have what's called the Michigan Association of Justice. And for our viewers who don't know, this is our organization of people who represent injured lawyers who represent injured people and basically trial lawyers. Absolutely. 100%. And you, and you sit and you, you are so active in the organization in helping in making sure that the highest ethical standards and on one of the most important things on helping advise on judges on on the judicial qualifications committee so interviewing our state's future judges and making sure that qualified competent judges get appointed or get endorsed so that justice can be done for all correct john and it's we want to make sure not just competent and qualified but they have a good temperament for both sides for both sides we want to make sure uh that they're well qualified and they have a great temperament to be a judge and that's not that's judges in the district court judges in the circuit court court of appeals and even the michigan supreme court so very important justices of the michigan supreme court go through our qualifications committee that i've been the chair for decades on yeah well thank you for all you do and thank you for coming on the show uh you've been practicing for how long now scott over 37 years no so how did you get into uh you do personal injury right how did you get into it? Like, how did you get into this line of work? You know, just growing up, seriously, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a trial lawyer. I always wanted to fight for the, uh, you know, fight the bullies, you know, take on the bullies. And their way to do that would be through with my words and my profession. And you've done a great job over the last 37 years. It's been amazing. So tell us about, you know, you're on Cases Gone Wild, so I hope you brought some truly crazy and wild cases to talk to us about today there's so many cases out there but i picked a few three of them in fact i picked three three cases that really were kind of weird and kind of wild and kind of crazy just for this just that's for this show well that's what we like on the show so without further ado why don't you what do you where do you want to start tell us let's start let's start with you know, some of the cases I do, I work on any type of injury case, okay? So mostly auto cases, uh, auto crash cases, explosion cases. Those are really uh, difficult cases. Those are complicated cases. Complicated and people get hurt, okay? And, and everybody blames everybody else in those. Everybody blames everybody else. But you know what? We've got fire inspectors. They get in there and they figure it out. And this one case that I brought today uh, happened to be uh, a gentleman. You know, he was a little slow um, on things, and 
he act he actually got to rent a an efficiency uh, efficiency apartment that was going to be torn down in the next several months. But well, why would you dude rent an apartment that's about to be torn down? He needed a place to stay. Okay. Bottom line. He needed a place to stay. And the owner, we didn't know when it was going to be torn down. The owner, you know, was one of those guys that was trying to get uh, a, a place built and he needed, he wanted to squeeze out a few dollars. Kind of like a slumlord type well, situation. I'm not going to call him a slumlord because he's, he, he's, you know, he's a professional out there uh, doing what he does. And, but in this particular situation, this is a pretty difficult efficiency and it wasn't well kept up period. So, so what happened? So my guy rents this place out. He has his brother help him bring in the bed, bring in some furniture so he can live there for several months until he finds a place to stay. All right. He has a girlfriend. His girlfriend is going to come over for the first night and they're going to clean the place up and do whatever boyfriends and girlfriends do on their on their own time. OK. And the defense said, well, they were smoking these big uh, blunts, you know, and they were, you know, doing all this you know, stuff. But the reality was he set the mood. He got the candles ready. <laughs> he had the bed ready. The girlfriend was there. They were going to have a good time. And at yeah, the end yeah. of the day. They were having a good time until there was an explosion. Okay. They both. Now, what kind of explosion? It was a gas explosion. Okay. Okay. Not like a sex explosion. No. Or so. Okay. No. Not. They think. I don't know if they got there yet. Okay? okay. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, uh, they were there. They were having a good time. And what happened was, there was a gas valve in the room, and the gas valve should have been capped. By the landlord. Okay? So when you say a gas, we're talking about like natural gas from like DTE energy or whatever. Na or? Natural gas valve. Okay. Where the landlord had removed some type of heating unit for that particular efficiency room. Like okay? a heater or something. Correct. It wasn't, it was a gas heater. So it wasn't like at one, at one time they had a furnace in there. It was, they had these units in each unit that regulated the gas. Okay. Like a heating unit. And they had removed that heating unit. Well, instead of capping that unit, they left the the cap off of the gas valve. Now, so there, so just so we understand, so there's like a gas pipe that comes into this heater. The landlord removes the heater and then doesn't seal the pipe up. Correct. Doesn't seal it like you can put a gas um, cap on it. And tighten it up, and it's there forever. Like a top yeah. to a pot bottle or yeah. something. top to a pot bottle, whatever. Right, exactly, top to a pot bottle. And unfortunately, they didn't put the cap on there. So what happened was there still is this lever for the gas to be turned on and off. And what happened was as they were having sex on the bed, the bed was moving. Oh, stop. Mo yes, this is what happened. The bed was moving. This is in the actual fire investigation report. Okay. The bed was moving. So they're getting it on. They're the getting bed's it on. The bed's going back bed's and forth. back and forth. Okay. And the gas valve now is open and there's no cap on the gas valve. So it's shooting out. Gas is going out. The candles are, be are, are in the room. Ah! The moon is set. And boom. Boom. No way. Wow. Are they naked in yes, bed? Yes, naked in bed. Boom. Oh, my it God. Explodes. What a way to go. This, right. who would think? It explodes. They're making some friction. You don't think it's going to light off the real explosion. Now, that's that's going out with a bang. That is explosive sex. Okay? And it goes. And they both are on fire running down the street naked. No okay? way. Yes, because they're naked. Okay? And they're on fire? And they're on fire. And they're running out the door because the place is engulfed in fire because it's an explosion. And they're out. And, and the, they were the gas was probably all over them. Gas was all. So it's not. It was. It wasn't. It was all over them. But they were on fire from it. Okay. Yeah. So they had to get out of that area. Okay. And one of the defenses was, why didn't you smell the gas while it was going? And unfortunately for my client, he, earlier in his life he was in a horrible car accident and lost his sense of smell. No so, way. Yes. So their defense was defenseless because he didn't have the sense of smell. You have to take your victim as you find him, you know? Right. And so there we go. He was burned. His girlfriend was burned. They were on fire. And this is one of the cases that I brought today. And one of the defenses was, look, they were all high. They were doing all these things. My guy had a marijuana card. So, okay, it, he didn't, he didn't uncap 
the gas valve. And then one of the photos that we had to take because he, to show his burns, showed his burns, unfortunately on his back, his, in, in big tattoo letters said Smokey. Okay. All right. Now, did he, okay. This is, this is wild. So Lord, we're going to show our viewers for those of us on YouTube, we're going to show the picture. This is the guy right here. Correct. All right. So for our listeners who are not on YouTube, uh, He's a goofy looking guy. He, he's a great guy. He's, he's such a, a nice guy. He really was a he was a really he was really a nice guy. Okay. Okay. All right. Now on his back is a he he has a hairy back like me by the way. This back <laughs> is this I hope nobody photoshopped my back on here cuz this looks exactly like my back. But he has a tattoo on his back that says Smokey in kind of the old English D script that we use for our Detroit letter. And then there's like a crab on fire. It's on fire. Did he get this tattoo to cur to remember the explosion or did he have this before the explosion? He had it before. Okay. That now that is one hell of a coincidence. It is a coincidence. So, so what happened? Well, he got, listen, we filed the lawsuit and we went after uh, the landlord who defended it as they normally defend these cases wanted to blame everybody else but themselves. They always do that. You know, I must have had the cap on there. I must have had the cap in there. And we dug deeper and we dug deeper. And we knew that in this particular set of efficiencies, there were other uh, tenants that had some challenges with gas. The smell of gas were moved around. So this was an ongoing problem in this particular area. But my guy didn't know. My guy just was happy to have a place to stay. He had his bed, he had his girlfriend, was having sex, and boom. Yeah, yeah, wow. That You know, there's a lot of shoddy landlord cases, you know, um, which is really scary. Unfortunately, I think these bad things happen in more low incomes or, uh, you know, kind of slums, you would say, or, or low income landlord communities where they don't, they try to drain as much money out and do as little as possible. He didn't have to rent this out. They were trying to squeeze out a few more bucks out of this, like you said, shoddy efficiency area. He didn't have to, we had a lease. You would think there wasn't a lease here. It was just like a handshake. And here's, he had a, they had written up lease. Everybody was signed. You know, there was a business that owned this, you know, this building. It was a written lease. We had them, and clearly, it was not a safe, a reasonably safe. No, and uh, you got place. you got to be careful. Like I've had seen cases where it's like poison gas, CO two, you know, yeah, comes oh yeah. out. You can die from that. Yeah, so because they don't replace the heat. The heater's like you know, forty years old, and they don't maintain it, and they don't do what they're supposed to do, and then suddenly. It's just like you go to bed and boom, your boom. whole life's right. changed. You know? So we wind up getting the full policy on this case. Good. And Stuart good. Sklar was the attorney on the other for the for the young lady that was injured. He's phenomenal. Stuart's He's a great guy. Stuart is great. Stuart brings me in on some of these cases where he has a conflict because both parties can't you know represent each other. Right. Here because there were some issues here on who was responsible for the fire. And uh, Stuart is a fantastic attorney and, and really specialized in fire work. Yeah, that must have been great to work with yeah, him on a great. case like that. I've, you know, I've worked on some explosion cases, but uh, I more had like kind of like a helpful roles, like when I was at Figer's office and stuff like that. But they're always crazy stuff. And some of the stuff like you can't believe it's like I remember doing one where it's like, you know, the, the handyman or the landlord set up a plug in the basement that had too many plugs in it or, you know, they put one of those power strips on it, plugged in a million things, and then the thing exploded and caused a fire. I mean, it's just crazy stuff that you don't really think of that can have such devastating consequences. Well, I, I represented, and Stuart was part of it, we represented these folks in, in Royal Oak where the whole block exploded. I mean, somebody died in that, the dog died. The entire block exploded. I mean, there, people had damage. I represented 22 people Why in did that it explode? Case. Gas because, leak? <laughs> gas leak. And the guys had the efforts at the end of the day, and they decided it was five o'clock quitting time, and they, they did not follow proper protocol when they were unidirectionally drilling down the street. You have to hand dig. All these old homes in all these neighborhoods, including Gross Point, Royal Oak, Birmingham, okay, you have, you have 
service going into your house. Well, if you're going to start drilling a new line to replace the lines, you got to make sure you open it up. You can't just go by these maps from 1929. You have to right, look. Right. You have to see it. And guess what? It was the middle of the winter. No one wants to dig these ditches in the frozen ground in the middle of the winter. So they didn't do a great job. And boom, the whole block blew That's up. That's insane. That's My building in Birmingham shook that night. Actually, a mile away. You could feel it? I felt it. I We left the building. We thought somebody hit the building because our building has like a part underground parking, underneath parking. We thought some truck hit the building. And I sent everybody home. And then I, I actually happened to go down to the cleaners, pick up my dry cleaning and all the... Birmingham police or fire are heading down and I didn't know until I knew what that's happened. scary you yeah. know we had a case where the gas leaked out and you know they add they put an additive into natural gas you smell it to smell it right yep. you ever like leave the stove on it smells like what rotten eggs right. kind of that is actually an additive that it's a chemical that the gas company puts into the gas to smell it because natural gas I don't know if you knew this, but it's actually scentless. Right. You could blow it up in your nose and you wouldn't smell it. Natural Correct. gas. So it was leaking out. In, there was a, a leak in a pipe under a house. And the gas was leaking out. But it was leaking into like sediment, you know, rocks, all that shit. Yes. And as it was getting, as the gas was building up under the ground and filtering through this get this sediment and dirt and stuff, the chemical that makes the gas smell was getting stuck in the ground because it had a different density or something. I don't know. The right. scientists yeah, no, told no, no. me. You got it. And then the real natural gas would filter out and it would be now, uh, you couldn't smell it. Correct. And it blew up. And, you know, then they try to do the thing, blame the person. But you got to bring in people. These are complex cases. Uh, expensive. Expensive cases. Uh, you know, it's crazy. We had... Um, that reminds me, uh, one thing I want to talk about that you said is about weed in cases. Mm -hmm. So I just tried a case in Oakland County. You may be familiar with the case. Barry Grant's son, Brent Grant, okay? Absolutely extraordinary result. Thank John you. Marco, one of the best trial lawyers, I got to tell you. And weed comes up because the kid used medical marijuana. Sure. He was a weed guy. He loved his weed. He was a gentle weed guy, you know, like takes an edible, chills out, whatever. I don't use weed. I don't judge people that do. Everybody has a different thing. You know, I like to drink wine probably a little bit too much. OK, that's my thing. Everybody has their thing. So uh, what do you think about how weed has changed over the years? Because I remember when I first started practicing, Scott, probably like 15 years ago, you would hear it was like a poster from the 1940s that the plaintiff used marijuana, the evils of marijuana, even if it has nothing to do with it. Like a guy could be walking down the street, get smoked by like uh, a car, and then he smoked a joint at his house a month later. And they would say like, this guy's a weed user. And some of the juries really didn't like it. Do you think that has changed? How do you deal with it? Can you talk a little bit about that? Listen, there's dispensaries on every block right now. It's generally accepted. You know, you know, so I think we've overcome that. If you're talking about drugs now, you really have to talk about heroin and fentanyl and hard stuff. That's going to be a problem for your case. But for weed, it's generally accepted, just like smoking a cigarette, vaping uh, or anything else or having a six pack. It's somebody's choice of how yeah. they want to live their lifestyle. Now, you know, you got to be concerned about who's on the jury and whether that's going to be a problem for them, you have to address it in voir dire. Yeah, and exactly. that's how to do it. I, I agree with what you just said 100%. I don't think, it doesn't scare me as much anymore, but I still ask about it. Like on that trial I just did uh, with Brent Grant, I asked the jury, I said, look, you're going to hear that, I don't know what it has to do with this case, but they're going to bring it up, and I appointed to the insurance company. You're going to hear that my guy used some me medical marijuana. He ate some edibles when he was recovering. How do you feel about that? And believe it or not, most people said, like one guy said, well, I have edibles in my fridge right now at home. He might have been high at the time. I don't know. Right. I knew he didn't have a problem with it. But there was an old cop from Redford, a guy, he was maybe 70 years old, old Caucasian cop who said, I have a problem with it. You know, he was policing for, 
you know, 40, 50 years and busting people for possession of marijuana. And he had a problem with it. And he was honest about it. Uh, so there is still some issues, but I agree with you. I, I don't think it's as it's it's not a killer, game killer anymore. Game but killer. it also can identify to you who you want on your jury, depending on the type of case you have. You can get you might be able to preempt or get them off for cause. That's He's right. Dead fast against anybody having any marijuana in their system. And you've got a, a client, a victim of an injury here uh, that had it in their system or used it to try to get well or try to overcome some of the pain that he was suffering. Yeah. Then you'll know right there who you want in your jury. You're you absolutely know. right. That's right. He, he had like said, I, I think it's going to bother me. I don't think I can be fair. And the judge in that case excused him. So, um, but it's important to talk about those issues, be aware of those issues. I mean, obviously you had a, was it an issue in this case with Smokey? 100%. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent was an issue. They wanted to blame them for it because he's they're smoking weed. And in fact, during the deposition, uh, when we talked about this, you know, I'm used to from my old college days, it would have been a little joint. OK, I wasn't used to the testimony where it came in, where it was like a big cigar blunt. Like yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah, like yeah. the size of a cigar. Yeah, like, yeah. OK, yeah. but what did that have to do with them having, you know, sexual relations on a bed to consenting adults? at night setting the mood what did them smoking weed have to do with this explosion they had nothing to do with nothing the landlords negligence for uh, for renting out to a tenant an uncapped uh gas line okay they had nothing to do with any of this but yes it was an issue they kept bringing it up and of course the fact that he had smoking on his back and tattoo just you know lend itself to a, a challenge but we resolved this case for 100%, you know, we were all set here. There was well, no let issue. me ask you one cu curious question. Sure. I'm looking at this tattoo thing. If we can put this up again uh, for our YouTube viewers. What's up with the crab on fire? What's I this don't crab? know. Okay. I have to, I'd have to dig into that. All I right, don't right. know. Well, that'll be the what, next The show. viewers may be able to yeah, tell us, Yeah, yeah. I don't there's know. A, there's a crab, and the crab appears to be on fire. But that's interesting. All right, so uh, tell us about another crazy case because I know you brought a lot of really good yeah, ones. Yeah, uh, one of the really big cases that has been throughout my years that really had bothered me quite a bit, and it's continuing on now, and there will be uh, you know additional cases um, that are being brought by other litigators in our profession, is the city of Detroit's just pure negligence in allowing some of their bus drivers, and, not, and let me make it clear here, bus drivers have a tough job. OK, but when you have a bad bus driver, just like you have a bad driver or a bad pet owner or a or, bad doctor or, 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 or a bad, or bad doctor, lawyer, lawyer, right? All, you of know? Them. Right, all of them, John, all of them. They need to be weeded out. They need to, We need to get rid of them. They need to be off the streets. Yeah. Put they them need, at a desk or something. Whatever if you, you want to do. You can't do it safely. Correct. Right. OK. And, you know, the concern I had was I had a guy that was just going to work. He drove his bike to work. OK, that's what he did. All right. And. He was he was an avid avid cyclist in the city of Detroit, and this bus driver. That's like, I ride my bike to work. It gets scary sometimes. It, listen, I wouldn't get on a bike. I wouldn't get on a motorcycle anymore. That's just me. I know. Yeah. I see it. Too many people are using their you know their social media while they're driving. They're texting. We've got the DoorDash drivers trying to find an address. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's scary out there. It is so. scary. I had a lot of bike cases, and. Injuries are really bad, especially brain injuries, which is scary. Absolutely. And in this particular case, my client was just driving his bike and the bus just ran over him. OK. Oh, my gosh. And he wound up behind the, the rear tire. And he oh, ran my gosh. Over him of a big city bus. Of a big city dress. Four thousand, forty thousand 40,000 pounds. Those buses are 40,000 pounds. <laughs> the the bicyclist has no airbag. He has nothing to protect him, and he got he got hit and run over. Oh my god! And really bad injuries, fractured his pelvis and and things. Did he die? He did not die. He did not die. He made a great recovery. Okay, thank God to, for that. All right, but it was really a bad injury. And of course, the city of Detroit. What happens is, and what's the frustrating part is, the first phone call that the bus driver made was to her union rep. The next phone call was to the transit authority, okay? And the police showed up, and the police show up, and they're doing their job, and they're investigating the scene, and the driver's got some BS um, statement, okay? She says, my guy was either driving the wrong way on the street or ran into the back of the bus and wound up running into a pole. Well, the police officer, to his credit, the city of Detroit police officer, to his credit, 
wasn't going to be bullied by everybody else in this case. Because did they send the transit people to the scene? 100%. They always do that. I hate litigating against the city of Detroit. We can talk about the reasons for that. There's good. There's some really good lawyers in the law department who are hardworking people, but litigating against the city is a complete nightmare. Okay. There's layers of trying to avoid responsibility here, and it causes more harm to other residents of the city of Detroit or visitors of the city of Detroit because you're covering up. It's a, always a cover up with the city. Right? It's it's always this one was a cover up. So what happened? So. The police officer, to his credit, he looked at the pole. He did swabs of the pole. He saw no blood or flesh on the pole, okay? But there was blood and flesh under the tire, okay? But what so, was the driver trying to say? Sh that our guy was trying to commit suicide, ah! okay? <laughs> yes. By driving his cycle under a city bus? Yes, he was trying Give to commit suicide. Give me and a break. And this guy had a solid job. He was at the job 20-something years. He had a great family. This was a family man. I mean, the whole thing was, but this is their, every day there's a new defense coming from this city. It's insane. You know, people talk about frivolous lawsuits, frivolous lawsuits. There are some. They're bad for the profession. I don't like them. I know you don't like them. them. They mess everything up for, for uh, legitimate claims. But there's also a lot of frivolous defenses exactly. where they just make shit up. Make it up. Make it up. Right. You and know? so in this particular case, here's how it started. So I send in, like you would normally do in your office, to the Secretary of State a request for the bus driver's record. Because that's where I'm going to start. Let's see. Yeah. You know, let's see what's going on here. You know, did she even get a ticket for this? crash okay because remember police officer at the scene fatal squad shows up transit authority shows up they shoo the cops away because now we're going to take care of the scene okay our guy is you know taken away in an ambulance he's trying to live you know and get to the hospital so he's gone and by the way there's a bunch of people on that bus that would have been a witness to what happened and let me guess okay? they didn't take a single statement remarkably witness cards were only produced for a couple people. One that we could never find allegedly was an ex uh, police officer that we never could, we couldn't find them, you know, during the discovery phase of the case. They couldn't find this particular person, you know, magically she disappeared and she wrote that he rode into the bus on that witness card. Completely bogus. Okay. And it just disappeared. Disappeared. People may not believe this stuff, and I'm going to tell a story after this, but I this is real life, and it's the city of Detroit is so bad to litigate against because this happens all the time. I can tell you so many cases where this same thing happened, and I'm going to tell you about one as soon as you're done. So, so now I send Secretary of State a request for the driving record of this particular bus driver, and it comes back. No record of any crashes, no record of any at fault, no record of tickets, nothing. Clean sheet of paper. Okay? For the bus driver. For the bus driver. Now, my, my client was told at the scene by the police officer that this lady has a horrible record. The bus driver. Bus driver. My client tells me this story. I do the Secretary of State thing. I got nothing. I'm like, what is going on Records, here? no record exists. Blank. Blank piece of paper. I have the blank piece of paper. So now I'm like, something's up, of course. So when we file the lawsuit, I send a subpoena to the Secretary of State, Michigan Secretary of State. I want an unredacted driving record of this woman. And they send me, and it was like pay dirt. It was like a miracle. I, there it was. There, the lady was involved in 30 crashes. 30? 30. 17 acts, 17 injury things in 30, 30 crashes. This woman was involved in 30 crashes. How can somebody, 30 crashes? Because dude, the that, law says they're only going to report at fault crashes. And every case that she was involved in. Was somebody else's fault? Oh, yeah, right. Shoot away. That is scary. Scott, that so, is scary. It, it is scary. And that endangers everybody, everybody on the road. It endangers everybody in Detroit. That protecting somebody like that, who's driving a 40,000 pound piece of steel around city streets, around kids, around bicyclists, around motorists, is ridiculous. So what happened was I went down to the city of Detroit 
to the basement. I do my own investigation. That's how I've learned how to do this my whole life. Okay. So I went down and I went down to the city of Detroit's there's a there's the basement, okay? I don't know how it is now, but it was back then. I went down, metal desks, you go down there, they have this little computer. You I punched, I gave a you used to give a card, okay, to the person behind the desk, and you I wrote out the lady's name, okay, and I looked on their computer and I looked all ways, different ways I can spell her name, okay? Because I, you know, I noticed some things on the computer where her name was in it. And I wrote out her name and I wrote out the card and I gave it to the person behind the desk and all the files on her were removed. By Gone. the city. Of course. They're not supposed to be taken out of there. You signed Somebody something. Somebody deleted the files? Oh, they took them. They took the, the physical paper files. This is like conspiracy okay. stuff. So I can't make this up. So now I looked on the computer and it wasn't in back then. And maybe it's about 10, 15 years ago. Back then, the, the, the computers weren't as sophisticated, okay? So the screens at the city of Detroit in the basement were the worst ones of all, okay? And I look in there, and I noticed a few names of lawyers that I recognized, okay? And I got to my car, and I picked up the phone, and I took a shot, and I called them, and I said, Do you, did you have a case against... They don't remember the name, but against the city of Detroit, a bus, you know, where there was a bus incident. He says, yes. And I said, I'm coming over. Can you find the file? He says, sure. Pulled it out of storage. I grabbed the file and I did my investigation through his file to prove that this lady was involved in other at fault accidents. OK. And remarkably, when I looked through his file, OK, I looked through his file and I looked at these witness cards and I looked at a card that was in like calligraphy and it was signed by a man. And I'm saying to myself, there's no way any man, I'm sorry to be sexist here, has this good of penmanship. OK. And writing on this little tiny card at the scene of a bus. And I looked at it and I looked and I saved it and I took a picture of it. And I'm like, this cannot be a valid witness because that case that the guy had, the witness card said, he, some lady had been op opened her door in this bus, the driver of this particular bus from the city of Detroit, had hit her, hit her as she opened her door, okay? But the witness card had said <laughs> the lady was like walking across the street and it, the bus never touched her and he just happened to be in the area, in the Hart Plaza area, and he witnessed this. And I looked at the name and I looked at my case and I realized in that other case, this was the bus driver's boyfriend. The same card? The same card was the bus driver's- Making up false witness statements? Making up statements? false witness statements. So what did you do with this? I, I just, this was part of my case. I started, I sent the things to writing specialists because now I'm worried that the city of Detroit inspectors are making up these witness cards or destroying these witness cards, or they're all fake, or who knows what they are. Who knows? Be right. We, we don't know, okay? It was all a lie. The, her, the bus driver's statement on my case was totally inconsistent with the physical facts, the evidence at the scene. Yeah. And I had the police officer to testify to that. Now, remember, what happened in my case, okay, and, and, and it wasn't just this case. There's other cases. So all these cases existed. They just never wrote the lady a ticket, so no one ever found out that she was involved in all these crashes. They hid it from the public. They hid it from everybody. And so now I have, I'm, I'm armed with all of this evidence. I'm armed with the, the boyfriend's witness card, which clearly he didn't write, okay? And the bottom line is at the end of the day, she was a liar, okay? They covered this up, okay? We did this whole investigation with the city. You know, I rejected the case of Al. We did, went through all these you know, all the, the rigmarole, okay? Um, the police officer was the key because I went to take his testimony and he wouldn't lie. And the city of Detroit lawyer, paralegal, transit, union, everybody called this guy in the day before his deposition. And said what? Don't tell him anything that I have to say to the lawyer, to me, Goodwin. OK, don't tell it. Tell him what we're telling you to say, period. 
Okay. And that's how this all went down. That's insane. Okay. And that's scary. It's because scary. if they can do it in a civil case where a guy was almost run over, they can do it in anything. But the police officer, the police officer had the moral compass to tell the truth. He was a police officer. He told the truth. And God bless him. Okay. So what happened in that case? Did you get? We, we wound up resolving it for a huge amount of money. I millions. hope so. It was millions. I hope so. So I got to tell you, because this is so troubling, that I had the exact same thing happen to me last summer. Okay. This isn't something that happened 30 years ago or something under Kwame or something. This happened last summer. I, I've talked about this case before, but I had a case against the city of Detroit that I was brought in to try where a massive commercial tire came off of a Detroit transit vehicle by DDOT, Detroit Department of Transportation. They operate the buses. It's the same yeah. people. And it was the day before the 4th of July. And so it was July 3rd and it was around five o'clock. And what's happening around that time, all the workers in the maintenance shop want to go home. They want to go have a barbecue. They want to drink a beer. I don't blame them, but they didn't put the wheel on. <laughs> they put the wheel on and they didn't tighten the bolts. Wow. So the van leaves and is driving down the city streets past pedestrians and all these people. And the, this massive wheel flies off going about 50 miles an hour down the road. My client is walking across the uh, street, you know, whistling to himself, do, do, da, do, da, doodly day, going to CVS dr pharmacy to pick up some cat food and some trash bags. He hears like a whoosh. He turns to his right and gets blasted by a bouncing uh, massive tire, which is like getting hit by a cannonball, dude. Exactly. Okay. But we won the case. But I want to tell you, I'm not going to go into all because I've talked about this before, but I want to tell you specifically, the same thing happened. Transit police came to the scene. Okay. Uh, they blamed my client, said that he ran in front of the tire to try to stop it. He just like saw a tire and ran in front of it. Uh, there was missing witness statements. And then here's the worst part about the whole case, Scott. So we file a case and I wasn't handling the case at the time, but they asked the city of Detroit for all the maintenance records who worked on this van on July 3rd, who didn't put the wheel on. Okay. Shouldn't be very difficult the transit department has to keep meticulous maintenance records because they need to know when to work on these vans and trucks and buses. It's like, okay, when do you change the oil? You change it every 3,000 miles. You need to know when you last change it. It's like a garage. They have this big garage. They have physical paper records that are in these big storage cabinets. And then they have a computer system that keeps all the repair logs, Who's the mechanic? Just like when you go to Tuffy Automotive or you're, you know, you go get your oil change at Valvoline, you get a printout. A receipt. A, a something, receipt. An itemized receipt of what they're doing so that the next time they go to fix this bus or van or whatever, they, they know, know what they did. They know, they know what, what they, they have did. to replace. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's basic. So we asked for the records. And here's guess what the city of Detroit says. They don't exist. All the records disappeared, disappeared. Right. that day of course so only that said, day only that day so we said well wait a minute do you have records after they go oh yeah we have records starting on july 4th the next day but where's all the records this van was 10 years old or whatever where's all the records oh they went missing what do you mean they went missing this is what they told the jury well we updated our computer system that day 12 hours after right. your dude got hit by a tire and is in the hospital. And they don't know if he's going to live or not. They right. thought he was going to die. So it could have been a homicide investigation. Correct. All the electronic records go missing and they never could explain where, except by saying they told the judge at least before trial, oh, it's not our fault. It was just a system update. Okay. By the way, they apparently only updated the system for this one truck out of like a thousand vehicles. All right, so it gets worse. So we go to trial, mm -hmm. and there's a mechanic who we get a journal from that has some repairs that were done to this van. 
And the journal pages are numbered. If you look closely in the top right corner, the journal's pages are numbered one through 100. It's like an old high school notebook. With the, the manufacturer of the notebook had printed the numbers on it. So this is how stupid they are, too. They're not, they're not. I know they're not as tricky. Right, okay. Right. So they're not good criminals. <laughs> I go, I go to July 1st. There's a record. I go to the page labeled July 2nd. Now remember, the accident occurred on July 3rd. There's a record. There's no record for July 3rd, the date of the accident. And then there's a record in the journal for July 4th. Well, they had ripped the pages out because if you looked at the top, it goes page 91, page 92, page 94. Right. So it's like, what's wrong with you? Like, so then we had that and then it gets even worse, Scott. You're not going to believe this. So we're at trial and I'm going through their protocols and I see that they have to keep paper records in a locked cabinet in DDOT, Detroit Department of Transportation headquarters in a filing room. Sounds similar to like your case where they you went to the basement and did this stuff. So the attorney who had worked this case up, it had changed hands. It had been seven years. You know, I don't want to Monday morning quarterback anybody, but, you know, there was stuff that we they didn't follow up on, okay? So we're in the middle of a trial in front of a jury, and I call the head of DDOT onto the stand, and I say, you know, you, you have paper records for this van, don't you? He's like, oh, yeah, we, we are required to uh, keep those records. Where are they kept? They're kept in a locked filing cabinet that I have a key for that's inside a locked filing room at DDOT headquarters. I said, well, we've asked for these records. Where are they? He goes, they went missing. I go, well, how? I go, sir, did you destroy all these records? You don't? He said, no, I didn't. But I'm going to tell you something right now, Mr. Mark. We said this in front of the jury, okay, because he wasn't going to go down for it. I don't know what happened. Maybe the world will never know. He goes, it takes somebody really, really high up to be able to go into this room and have access to destroy these records. That's all that I can tell you in this jury. Somebody really, really high up. This is what is coming out in a court of law in the United States of America, Scott. Could you hear a pin drop? Oh, yeah. You could hear a tire drop. Right. And the uh, we we found a document in the middle of the trial that, you know, you said that the city transit authority is always there on the scene. There was a receipt. So remember, they said we didn't do anything wrong. There was no reason to involve anybody. There was a receipt dated July 3rd that said, Request to the City of Detroit Law Department right. at the scene immediately at the time of the accident. So why in the world are they requesting the City of Detroit Law Department to get involved on a just an accident where nothing wrong happened and then everything goes missing? And I'll tell you, Scott, it's scary. It's it is scary. scary. And it's not okay, all right, because everybody needs a moral compass. Okay, that means the lawyers, that means everybody, all right? And these folks showed up at the scene of my crash too, everybody. Lawyers, paralegal, I found that thing, that the paralegal showed up at the scene. I mean, this is insane. Who's showing? Who, it's what, insane. What do you mean lawyers are showing up at the scene? It's a conspiracy, and people don't believe it. I didn't believe it until I saw it happen, that this could actually occur, and it really is scary because— it threatens uh, the justice system, and it's wrong. It's morally wrong. It's it's illegal, too. I mean, you know, nobody got held accountable. Scott, who deleted the records in your case? They're we, still out there. I know. And the interesting part was after I resolved the case, I was so upset, okay, because, you know, for us, we can just get our clients money. We can get them compensation for their injury. I can't turn back the clock and go back to the day before, okay? I can only get them money damages to kind of try to make them whole. I'll never make them whole, but I can try, all right? And it bothered me, and I and I sent a letter out to Channel 7, and I asked them to look at this, and they started doing digging, and they did a four-part series on it. No way. And we found out, we found out that 30 of the actual bus drivers, 30 of the bus drivers were driving 40, 
thousand pound buses on suspended licenses. Oh my god! Didn't even have driver's license that were valid. Are you kidding? How nope. can this happen? I, how, you you ask? I mean, tell me. I you couldn't even run the most rinky dink business like that, and this is the city government. That's scary, and uh, uh, that's why we're here, though. Remember, we're the watchdogs. We're the people that have to hold them accountable. We're the people who have to fight, okay, against these conspiracies. We have to fight because every day there's a somebody gets hurt, and then there's some story about blaming the victim. Yeah, and that's Always why blame I the got victim. involved in being a lawyer because I could try to right some wrongs. Yeah, and Everything it's so we powerful. Do, matters in every case whether it's in a district court a circuit court court of appeals and every individual matters they matter to the their family they matter to their spouse and they matter to us and that's why we do what we do yeah and you know you may have saved people's lives seriously correct and if it you hadn't dug and dug how many other times did this happen and if you hadn't done that this lady could have still been driving the buses around running over people and i tell that to my colleagues i say look you guys don't just settle the case for a quick buck do some digging get in there dig in okay find out what's going on here make a difference okay because we do want to protect the public so it doesn't happen to the next person and you and i could be walking to a restaurant from your law firm okay in detroit and have a big bus bearing down on us we yeah. want to make sure or that a the tire or fucking a hit you in the head right we want to make sure the drivers are qualified just like we want to I make sure in the judicial qualifications that the judges are qualified. Right. We want to make sure that the maintenance folks are doing their job. Yeah. This is simple. It's not And hard. when we run our law firm, I make sure my lawyers are qualified to provide competent, best legal service. Uh, you know, that's just, that would be like us having lawyers who were disbarred going out and representing people. I Correct. mean, it's insane. Insane. It's absolutely insanity. Do you think it's changed with the city? I think it may have changed for a little while. But it's my understanding that uh, there's another bus case that's coming up that we're going to find out the same things. Yeah, okay? I saw that. Yep. I think somebody got run over. Yep. And I have, my understanding is the bus driver had multiple uh, other problems. And who knows, once they dig in there, you know, sometimes you're just scratching the surface, right? Where there's smoke, there's fire, well, you know? I think this attorney is very qualified to find out the truth and to expose it. And let's start this process again. Yeah, it's crazy. It's scary. Uh, and remember, you know, this isn't for some reason. And I hate to pick on the city of Detroit. I love the city of Detroit. My office is in the city of Detroit. I'm down there six out of seven days a week. Uh, but the it seems like with regards to some of the lawsuits involving wrongdoing, that there's always funny business with the city in regards to lawsuits. Like, remember Kwame... Uh, there's a guy named Norm Yatuma who had that case uh, where the city was sanctioned like over $100,000, I think, for hiding documents, deleting documents, not producing documents. I mean, it's like things just go missing. You know what, John, in your case with the with the van, with the, with the tire, what if they would have just told the truth? You guys would have resolved this case. Everybody would have went on. I mean, why did... The reason you got your high verdict yeah. is because now people are appalled at what happened. Yeah. Usually these big verdicts come when somebody is doing something wrong. So wrong. Or lying. And, and the jury in that case said $10.4 million. And I'll tell you, those jurors were angry and that they cared about that case. And they cared. One of the jurors was a, a, a gentleman from Redford. He, he His sister died in the middle of the trial. His sister died and the judge said to him, uh, you can get most people. You know, look, let's be honest. Most cases, most people are like, I don't want to sit on a jury, at least in the beginning. Sometimes I think in a lot of cases they change. But in this case, the guy's sister died in the middle of the trial and the judge said, we're going to excuse you from the jury. He said, no, he said, I need to take two hours off to do the funeral on Wednesday morning. And judge, I want to be here and I want to see this through to the end. And that is powerful because what that says to me is he cared. He wanted to make a difference, too, uh, and was kind of appalled at what he was seeing occurring. Um, you know, where people don't care, they'll say, yeah, I'm out of here. You know what I mean? Moral compass. Moral compass. Make a difference. 
Everybody has to make a difference. You can incrementally make a difference to make change. It doesn't have to be all at once. All these little things make a difference. Like, you know, if you're cutting a, a, a rubber band, okay, eventually if you're stretching and stretching, it's going to break. So every, every little cut, you know, helps. Yeah, and I found my cases, uh, I find oftentimes we can make a difference. It's frustrating. Sometimes it's slow. And sometimes you just make a difference to one person. So maybe one person who does something bad uh, can make a difference. You can make a difference. Like I've sued Department of Corrections and the first time they didn't listen, the second time they didn't listen, the third time they didn't listen. On the fourth time, finally, the guy who was the wrongdoer finally retired early. Okay. Early. Now, we know it was took four lawsuits where they finally said retire early, but it made a difference. He's gone. And hopefully right. those bad things won't happen to other people. Uh, so I, we can make a difference in our practice. Right. And you want to, you want to weed out the bad people because there's so many great bus drivers who care, who have to face a lot of challenges every day in the city. Okay. We know that we see what's going on, you know, in this country. And so we want to support and be a positive force for the ones that are there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one rotten apple can spoil the barrel. I do police cases. I also represent a lot of police officers and I represent corrections officers. You know, that's a big part of my practice. But I also have sued bad police officers who've done bad things. And I always tell the jury, look, you know, I believe, and, and this is truly my belief, 99% of police officers want to do a good job, try to do a good job. Uh, but there's some bad apples like in any other thing and they can spoil the barrel and we all want them out. You know, my guys, I was talking to one of my friends who's a police officer in Chicago last night and he tells me like he's supportive when he sees like a bad case because he's like they they make they give me a bad name. You know, they give they make my job harder when they're doing bad things. The same thing goes with buses and doctors. You know, lawyers too. Sure. There's, there's bad lawyers. We've got to sure. get them out of there. You know? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. So, all right. So now that we've really <laughs> tackled some difficult cases yeah. right uh tell me so tell me about this other cases gone wild let's switch gears a little bit uh, this one is fun this one was fun okay look um we filed that you know i do no fault auto accident cases all the time and part of those is when someone gets catastrophically injured maybe they have a brain injury um they're taken care of by their loved ones at their home okay and it's called attendant care the people that take care of them get paid to take care of them because you know, there's a lot of people that are very private. They don't want some nurse or some stranger coming to their house every single day. They would rather have their loved one take care of them. You know, a, an aunt, an uncle, a friend, a family member, somebody that they trust to be in their home while they're incapacitated. All right. And in this particular case, you know, in the law provides that a family member can take care of you at, at, in your home. In this particular case, we had uh, a minister, wonderful uh, gentleman, who was taking care of his aunt who got hit. She was an elderly lady who got hit and was seriously injured. She had brain damage. And of course, the insurance company said she didn't have a brain, you know, it, I mean, social services came in and said, this woman needs help. She's got a brain injury. She cannot take care of herself in her own home. And the, the minister stepped up and he says, I, me and my wife are going to take care of her in our home. We're going to take care of her. We're going to make sure that her needs are met physically, emotionally, the whole thing. I mean, it's crazy what they say. I had a case where the, a third of a dude's brain was liquefied. It was the guy who got hit by the tire that I, I was telling mm -hmm. you about. A third of his brain. The doctor showed an image of the dude's brain. He had so much bleeding. One third of his brain was smushed gone. Right. and gone. And they're like, oh, he, he, he doesn't have that bad of a brain injury. It's our standard fight. Okay. So now... Let's we so I I send my my uh, forms in. We send all this in. They ignore them. They won't pay. They say they they won't do anything. So I I go ahead and file a lawsuit. The only thing I can do and me and you can do is yeah, file the right. lawsuit. Get justice. Get our jury. Go. Yeah. Two okay? years later. Right. Right. Two so, years later. And that's frustrating because these people have put their lives on hold to take care of her, and that and they're not paying. So I send everything in. I send the lawsuit in. Crickets. No response, no answer. Like I, I know the insurance company. We've served them properly. 
it's an insurance company. It's not an individual. We're not chasing anybody around. I'm like, I'm my, my legal assistant. I'm like, you know, Kim, did you serve this right? Do, is, do, have we crossed our T's, dotted our I's? Because now I'm like, why aren't they answering? No answer. Then I filed default. Okay. Same thing. Serve it. Do, do what we were, were required to do under the law. No response. Now I'm reaching out to people like the adjuster. Like, what's going on here? Why are you guys not responding? Because at the end of the day, I want to get my client paid. Yeah, okay? right. I think this is a clear cut case. And get her they're paid. desperate. Like, see, they're that's desperate. The, that's they're the desperate. power dichotomy. There is people are hurt. They can't work. They're messed up. They need the benefits more than ever. And the insurance company knows that and they can wait it out. And they're in a much better position to uh, take the long, play the long game than somebody who's struggling and, you know, needs help. Right. So I bring my client to court. We take a default judgment against them. Okay. We do. We The judge orders an amount of money. I think it was a couple hundred thousand at the time because we just started the this case, a couple hundred thousand in attending care. And, and who was it? Who was the insurance company? Yeah, Allstate. Allstate. Oh, yeah. So it's Allstate. Allstate House Council now is on this case. All right. And I get nothing and I get no response. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong here? OK, I got a writ of execution from the court. So okay? tell our our listeners what it is, because it's not always easy. You don't just file a lawsuit and get a check. Right. But if you do win and you go through everything, you get a judgment, get a judgment and you got to have some a judge order. that You're allowed to go there and collect. Kind of like what we're seeing with the, the Trump stuff. If you see, you know, in the news right now where they're trying to get, you know, if he doesn't pay the bond or he doesn't pay the 400 million, they're going to try to execute on the judgment. OK, so you go out. So if they don't pay the money, then you do what? You I go to the court. I get this writ of execution, which allows me the legal right to go in and take their stuff. OK, to get to collect on my judgment, my couple hundred thousand dollar judgment. Now, to like take their stuff and sell it, like they're. Whatever we need to do to satisfy the judgment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to go collect. So I call this guy. They call him the cowboy. He's up in Flint. He's a sheriff. He brings his people down. So the sheriffs, sheriffs go with you. Go with us. I can't just show up. I've got to have a sheriff that's going to execute on this judgment. Okay. So, so do you go where? where so now I'm concerned. So now, now, and I can't take stuff that Allstate doesn't own. So we're running tabs in the parking lot to see if the cars are owned by Allstate, the corporation. Stop it. Yes, we're doing all these things. So Wait, where is this? At like the Allstate's th corporate this is office? This Allstate's home office, corporate office, which used to be in the Galleria on 12 Mile in, 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 in tele between Telegraph. Is Allstate and, a Michigan company? Southfield. I didn't yeah, know. Well, oh. This is where they're at. Their house council was there. That's okay. their corporate offices. That's where everything happens. Okay. So sheriff's with me. I'm like, okay, what am I doing wrong here? I'm, I'm going to get sued for abusive process. I'm doing something wrong. What am I doing wrong? Okay. Because this can't be happening. Why is nobody responding to me? Did you call the lawyer? I call, I, We just showed up. I showed up at 3.30 on a Friday so they couldn't file an appeal. Okay, good. Okay. I, that's a good timing. Okay, so it's all about timing, timing. baby. <laughs> okay, so I show up. I don't want any appeals. I wanted. I wanted to file something to try to stop all this. So I show up there, and you can't get in the building because there's it. They, it's all locked down. All right. So the sheriff shows up with his badge. They let him in, and we we go in, and and this is House crazy. Council is there, and he brings me into his office, and and I'm like, and I'm like, I need to talk to a lawyer. They were leaving me in the, you know, the waiting room. I said, I have a writ of execution. Here's the judgment. Here's all the paperwork, blah, 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 and blah, And is blah. the sheriff there? And the sheriff's with Did me. you have a moving okay. truck? Okay. We had a moving truck. Had so you had a big We were ready to go. Big truck. You were going to take the computers. Everything. And Anything we get our hands Artwork. On. And, 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 and so we're delayed and we're delayed and we're delayed and we're delayed. And some guy comes out from human resources and says, and, and the sheriff now is is angry because he doesn't want to wait anymore. He's got he's paying these guys for their time. He wants to start moving things, okay? And he's going to start taking things no, no matter what. He's taking stuff, okay? <laughs> he's going to take pictures off the wall. He doesn't care, all right? And office so, furniture. Right, every, office furniture. And the guy comes out from Human Resources. He's got some title, vice president or something. And he start and the sheriff starts talking before I start talking, which is fine. I don't care. He's got the gun. He's got the gun on his hip. He's got the badge. I, you know, you don't, you don't see it, but he's got the cowboy hat on. He's got his he's got his cowboy boots on. They call him the cowboy. Okay, 
and he, he and the guy comes out and he says, well, who are you? Because he's not in a suit. Who are you? And the sheriff looks at him and he says, well, sir, what's your name? He says, my name's so-and-so, like pounding his chest like he's a big shot. And he says, we're going to start in your office. Ah! We're going to start in your office. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, House Counsel, the head of House Counsel, you know, that has the title, the name. You know, all, you know, all state always has a name uh, associated with their House Counsel. He comes up and he brings me back and, and because they're starting to take the computers now. Okay? They're, are they actually the, disconnecting? They're disconnecting it? the computers. No oh, way. Yes, are, because that's how they're going to shut all state down. Yeah. So yeah. he says, OK, just everybody settle down, brings me back. And he says, Scott. Can't we just work this out? Can we can we set up an arbitration for this? An and arbitration? I'm like, are you are you kidding me? We're way past arbitration time. Yeah. Okay. Way past it. But this is listen to me. This is what they are so insulated and think that they can do whatever they want. This is how they think. It's that insane. I'm, right. That I'm just gonna roll over and we're just gonna work this out. And your clients hanging on for dear life. And my client has been suffering taking care of their loved one the whole time. He could probably use a new computer. He needs whatever he can. Yeah. Okay. And he was, Oh, and by the way, I brought him with me. Oh, no way. Oh yes, I did. I brought my, so what with happened? Me. I brought him with me. And so he went in there and he wrote me the check for the full amount. Oh, isn't and that left, funny how that but, works? And meanwhile, I had to pay the, you know, the sheriff six grand and, you know, Oh yeah. But I had to do the, you know, all the to, headaches to you. I mean, just to enforce, People don't realize it's not like, oh, you win and then it's over. Sometimes this is like the case gone to the extreme. Right. It's not the it's not on TV where the, the show starts 30 minutes and you're done with the, you know, the problem occurs and you're in the jury. They solve it. And it's solved. And, and everybody and, gets paid and, and everybody's, everybody's happy. Right. Everybody's hugging everybody. I'm like, there's been a lot of a lot of plotting. And, 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 you know, this thing has been going at a glacial pace. Yeah. But, you know, these four people needed this money and they got paid. And I'm like. Are they going to bounce the check? You know, you don't know what you never gonna know what's going to happen. Right. That's crazy. I had we'll end on this because I'm being told uh, we've gone so wild today <laughs> uh, in the last hour. But I heard us I can go forever. But I know. Me I too. So me too. Kids, so much me fun. too. We'll have to have you back because we'll it's been back. great having you on the show. But I heard Jeffrey Figer had a, a writ against Beaumont Hospital. Do you remember this story? Sure he did. And he showed up. Same thing. He got a Probably judgment. Probably had the cowboy. They Probably had the cowboy with him. <laughs> they wouldn't pay him. He brought a moving truck up to Beaumont Hospital, and they were going to start loading like x-ray machines sure. and stuff into the truck. Uh, I think like a half an hour later, some guy came down with a check. Right. But, you know, why but do you have what, to do that? Why do, why do, do I have to do that? And you know what? It, I We sent documents. We sent letters. We sent emails. Guys, what's up here? And it was just, I don't know if it was incompetence or it was sheer neglect or just the uh, the audacity they had to the ignore. Arrogance, the the arrogance, arrogance that they had, that they were not going to pay. It's insane. That's insane. But that's why we're here. Well, hey, man, it was great having you on, Scott. Fantastic, thanks a lot. Fantastic, John. Great to be here. It Thank was you. awesome to hear some of your stories. Keep up the good work. Thank you for everything you do for the state of Michigan, the people of the state of Michigan. Uh, and through the Trial Lawyers Association, Michigan Association of Justice. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Great to be here. All right, everyone. It's been another great episode of Cases Gone Wild. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, if you or someone you know needs help, please don't hesitate to contact us. That's MarcoLaw.com and 833-MARCO-LAW, M-A-R-K-O-LAW. And thank you to our special guest, Scott Goodwin. If you need his information, don't hesitate to contact us. He runs a great practice out of Birmingham, helping, as you heard today, all kinds of injured people. He's a fighter for the people and a fighter for the state of Michigan. Until next time, we'll see you in two weeks here on Cases Gone Wild.